My name is Dr. Jim Davies. I am a cognitive scientist from Carleton University, and here I am at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. Artworks of various kinds pique our curiosity by showing us things that are somewhat incongruous, something that we don't quite expect. That might be an unusual kind of face in a painting. In music, it might be a change of key or rhythm. And in a story, it might be a plot twist. Things that are incongruous activate our dopamine system, and it sets our mind in motion trying to figure out what's going to happen or why something is incongruous. It's the same logic that makes us pay so much attention to stage magic shows. We see something impossible, and that's incongruous, and it makes us look hard and try to figure things out. A lot of artists do what they do because they're wrestling with some kind of problem, something in their life that they don't understand. It might be love, or it might be death. And as they wrestle with it, they create art to try to make sense of it, and maybe try to communicate the problem, or maybe what they see as the solution to the problem, to their audience. A lot of the appreciation of art is of two different kinds. One is sort of a pleasurable recognition of pattern that often comes across as beauty. And another is piquing our curiosity by showing us something unusual or incongruous. And many works of art take advantage of both things. In a piece of music, for example, it manipulates between familiar patterns and changes that regain our interest and pique our curiosity. So a good work of art will often involve a lot of familiarity and incongruity that balances between pleasure and drive, the opioids and the dopamine in our brain. We are looking at a painting by Daphne Ojig. It's called Rebirth of a Culture. This is a painting that really captured my curiosity. Um, there are a lot of things going on and it's sort of uh, endlessly fascinating to look at. I'll talk about some of the things that are in it and the psychology behind why we find uh, paintings interesting. If you look, you can see faces in here, lots and lots of faces, and that draws in our familiarity. And people tend to like paintings and things like that that have recognizable features in them, animals and faces. We have a whole part of our brain dedicated to looking at faces. So there's no surprise that many, many paintings feature human beings and human faces. But you also notice that the faces are not particularly realistic. This one has no mouth. This is two faces that are kind of uh, combined in a strange way. And this draws in our uh, curiosity. When we see things that are not quite what we're used to and not quite what we're expecting, our mind starts a process of trying to understand it and trying to figure out what's going on there. And a painting often doesn't offer a whole lot of answers, which means your mind can't let go of it and it keeps, you keep searching. And that kind of searching is the basis of a um, the curiosity that drives you. There's also a lot of pattern going on in this painting. First of all, we have colors. So we have repeating colors here and over here. And when we see the same thing in many places, that familiarity brings some pleasure. So one of the key things about appreciating art is this balance between pleasure and drive. And the pleasure often comes out of recognizing things, seeing patterns. And the drive, the drive to understand more, often comes from things that are incongruous and a little bit strange. This little pattern here, right? We have similar kinds of patterns here. But then it's contrasted with very large areas that don't have a whole lot of detail, right? Why is that? This kind of thing makes our mind wonder. So this piece here is the kind of piece I think you could have uh, a reproduction hanging on your wall and uh, never get tired of looking at it because there's so much mystery and incongruity that keeps you curious. Here we're looking at Shaman and Disciples by Norval Morisot, also made in 1979. We can see three main human figures here and they are recognizably human. Um, but they do have some characteristics that are a little different. This is a, a characteristic mouth shape in many of this artist's paintings. And it kind of resembles um, a beak. And in uh, some of the other works, this is made more pronounced. Here we have another bird. Here we have a bird with a um, kind of a, a hooked beak that we can see. And here we have a few more. 
these uh, pointed elements are a recurring theme. The fact that these people are kind of merged together makes us wonder what's happening here. Are they all part of the same being? Are they separate? Some of the colors are shared between a person and an animal. It makes the difference between humans and animals seem a little less severe, which uh, draws us in, makes us wonder um, about that. We also have lots of patterns and repeated colors. These two works are, they feature some very bright coloration. It really stands out, very saturated colors, uh, unlike a lot of paintings that use a more muted palette. And uh, this is, uh, the saturated colors are very attractive, particularly to young children, which is one of the reasons that babies' toys and cartoons and coloring books feature very saturated colors. It probably speaks to us at a very primal level. Here we have another painting. This is Forest Wilderness by a group of seven artists, J.E.H. MacDonald. And like many landscape paintings, it has some features that make us think that it's really beautiful. It turns out that human beings evolved to find a landscape beautiful if it was a good place to camp. So what do we have here? It's a view from high up. Here we can see that we're high looking out. We can see very far. And this allows us to see where water is, see where maybe animals are, maybe enemies that might be coming to harm us. So a view from high up is usually good. This is why we don't often have a lot of landscape paintings that are of um, wall faces or cliff faces, because uh, the visibility is very poor. We also have a lot of lush wilderness. Wilderness and plant life is indicative of possibly fruit and uh, other uh, things to eat. Uh, so. Our ancestors who found these kind of views pleasurable uh, tended to camp there and uh, had more offspring. The artist also uses some tricks to make it look a little bit more three-dimensional, which are very interesting. So if you look high up in the distance, one of these, one of the reasons this looks like it's further away, even though it's a part of a two-dimensional painting, is that the colors are muted. It's called desaturated and they're a little bit bluer. And in fact, if you go to a real landscape and look off in the distance, the mountains you see in the distance look bluer and a little foggier. This is because of atmospheric effects. On the moon, you wouldn't get that. But here on Earth, some of the colors on the redder side of the spectrum get pulled out the more atmosphere it goes through. And so you get that des desaturation. The reds are actually down low near the front. These are things that are closer to us. So it's possible that the artist put more red to emphasize even more the difference between the red and the blue to add the perception of depth. This is a beautiful painting. This is all about curiosity. But as I said before, there's curiosity and then there's pattern detection and familiarity that causes pleasure. There's pleasure and drive. And this painting, I would say, is mostly pleasure. When you look at this painting, there's not a lot to wonder about. It's relatively straightforward. There aren't a lot of incongruities that your mind needs to figure out, but that's okay. It's a different way to make a painting compelling. It's just pure beauty with nothing to make you really wonder or curious, but it works anyway. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.